Okay, Sabbath blessings, everyone. If you can all kneel, let's begin with prayer. Oh, and just before that, just to make sure, can everyone hear me? All right, cool. All right. So let's all kneel in prayer. And lift holy hands and bow our hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing us together once again as a church family on this Sabbath day. Please bridle my tongue and any tongue that shall speak on my behalf. Please send your angels and your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds this day. And may we grow in faith through the things which we uh, look into. May our hope increase in that appearing of the Saviour, which we know is going to be very soon. And most of all, Father, we pray that our love will deepen for you, for our Christ, for Christ, our King, and for the Holy Spirit and how he guides us into all truth. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all your manifold blessings which you pour out upon us each and every single day. We even thank you for the trials because we know that these fiery trials we go through will help us to stand firm in the future and will bring forth gold, silver and precious stones in our character. And we love, so we uplift and pray this prayer in the name of your Son, our Saviour and our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> amen and Amen. So, uh, this week we're going to be looking at the drink offering once again. And of course, last week we uh, was part one of this study. And I'm actually thinking now, because the Lord gave me more things to add to this, so it might be another two weeks of looking into the drink offering, but that's fine. So, let's start off by just going over what we went through last week very briefly. Okay, so we see in Numbers 15.5 that the drink offering is mentioned and that it was to be poured upon the burnt sacrifice. So the burnt sacrifice and the drink offering, they went together. So you would, the animal would be slain, which was a representation of Christ dying for the sins of the people, of course, in the future. In this case, because, of course, all of these offerings were in the Old Testament dispensation. And then once the animal was burning on the altar of burnt sacrifice, that's when the drink offering would be poured upon it. And we looked at how the first example of the drink offering being mentioned in the scripture is after Jacob had his name renamed to Israel after wrestling with the angel and then in verse 14 of Genesis 35 we saw that he poured a drink offering upon the pillar in the place where God spoke with him and we saw how this is a symbol of the fact that when Christ would come, he would pour out his soul even unto death, which we're going to look more into today. Um, um, we also saw how the drink offering could only be poured out in the court of the sanctuary. It was never to be poured out in the on top of the altar of incense in the sanctuary itself, because the sanctuary itself, of course, represented heavenly things. Whereas the court represented those things that would go down upon the earth how do we know this because the bible tells us that the um that the sanctuary would to have was to have four corners or the court was of the sanctuary was to have four corners and in scripture god likens the earth and he says that he talks about the four corners of the earth north south east and west so not a literal like four corners like a flat earth but it's symbolic of the north east south and west and then in Numbers chapter 28, now I'm not going to read all of this because we did read this last week, but I'm just going to read from verse 7 where it says, And the drink offering thereof shall be the full part of an hymn for the one lamb. In the holy place shalt thou cause the strong wine to be poured unto the Lord for a drink offering. And last week we spoke about how that word there, strong wine, in the strongs, that Hebrew word is alcoholic wine. So this was wine that was fermented. We know that generally speaking, not generally speaking, um, the Israelites, and that, 
includes us as Christians today, we are forbidden to drink alcoholic wine or any kind of alcohol. But in this case, in this particular offering, strong drink was allowed. Obviously not to be drunk because all of it was poured out upon the burnt offering. And so this week, I'm going to start in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 9. And we're going to look at why it was strong drink or alcoholic wine that was poured in the burnt offering. And so in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 9, it says, They shall not drink wine with a song. Strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. And then in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, we read, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So here we see that bitter is being used as a symbol for evil. And we see earlier on in Isaiah, he's calling, he's saying that strong drink shall be bitter. And then in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, which of course, Isaiah 53 is the whole chapter, is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ that was written around 750 B.C., so 750 years before he was even born, he says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So when Christ died at the cross, the Father literally poured his wrath out upon Christ. He poured the iniquity of us all on Jesus. And in Revelation chapter 14, verse 10, this, this verse is later on in the study, but if Gabriel can put Revelation 14.10 into the um, chat, you will see that um, wine can also be a symbol for the wrath of God being poured out. And for those that reject Christ, that reject his sacrifice, they will have to suffer the wrath of God being poured out upon them in the second death. But for those that put their faith in Jesus and in his precious blood, to wash away all their sins and to live a life of righteousness through Christ and through faith in the sacrifice he made at Calvary. Yes, we will not have to suffer that wrath because that wrath was poured out upon the Lamb of God, upon Jesus Christ. And so in Colossians chapter 3, 9, we read, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. That old man, of course, being uh, uh, the person we was before we met Jesus Christ. Or if you haven't yet given your life to Christ and you're listening to this, I would urge you even this day to get on your knees and surrender all to Jesus and to, to put your faith in him that he did die for your sins on the cross. Once you do this, the Bible says you will be born again in John chapter 3. Now, of course, it's not a literal being born again, but it's a spiritual and Every single person here listening who, is, who knows Jesus has experienced this miracle of being born again. Many of you will know my testimony of how I was before I decided to truly give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the sins that I used to commit and all of us used to commit. We were different people. We were in the world. We were children of wrath. We were children of the devil. But when we gave our lives to Christ, he puts his spirit upon us and changes us we become a new person and that's why in Romans chapter 6 verse 6 it says knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin yeah so in Ephesians four twenty four, it says and you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness so yeah, the drink offering representing the wine being poured out. And so as Christians, we're to pour out all um, all of those old ways, of the sins which we committed before we met Christ, that's to be put away. That's to be put onto the cross. And of course, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we're to truly burn all of our old, of our ways, our sinful ways, upon that burnt altar, upon Christ. We're to be crucified with him. And the life which we now live after giving our life to Jesus is not supposed to be a life 
lived for our own self and our own selfish gratifications, but supposed to be a life for the glory of God and Christ. And we looked at this last week um, here in Deuteronomy 14. And of course, we looked at the verses last week as well, which show that we're not supposed to um, we're, we're not supposed to drink strong drink, alcoholic drink. And yeah, so just in case you wasn't here last week, in, in verse 26 of Deuteronomy, it says that when the people of God back in the Old Testament would come to the holy place, would come to, let's say, Jerusalem, where the priests were and the temple was, they could bring strong drink, which is alcoholic drink, to the priests. But of course, we know why that was. It wasn't for the priest to drink, because that was forbidden. But it was so that this strong drink or strong wine could be used in this particular offering, the drink offering. And we looked at this verse last week where Paul, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 17, he compares himself um, to the drink offering where he says, And if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. And so now we look into First Chronicles chapter 11, verses 15 to 19 where we see an example of a drink offering in the old testament and it says now three of the 30 captains went down to the rock to david into the cave of adalai and the host of the philistines encamped in the valley of Rephid, uh, sorry, rephaim and david was then in the hold and the philistines garrison was then at bethlehem and david longed and said Oh, that one would give me a drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem that is at the gate. And the three break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. But David would not drink of it, but poured it out to the Lord and said, My God, forbid it me that I should do this thing. Shall I drink the blood of these men that have put their lives in jeopardy? For with the jeopardy of their lives they brought it, therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mightiest. So, just a bit of context. David, at this point in his life, he's not king as yet. He is this, this, so this is after he's slain Goliath and before he becomes king. And currently at this point, Saul is the king of Israel. And he hates David because he's jealous of him. And he's been hunting David down to try and kill him. And so at this point, David is hiding in the cave of Adullam. He's thirsty. He tells his men that he's thirsty. And then three of his mighty men, they go to the well of Bethlehem. They give him water to drink. But then when David sees that they risk their lives to give him this drink, um, David pours it out as a drink offering. And these historical accounts that are given to us in the Old Testament, they're all there for a reason. And a lot of the time... They have um, a symbolic meanings to them and why these, why God allowed events to take place in such a way, as we see when we go deeper into the scripture. So we see here in verse 17 that David was asking for water from the well of Bethlehem. Now, of course, most of us here, or probably all of us would know where Messiah was born, where our Lord and Saviour was born. In Micah chapter 5 verse 2 it says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So of course, um, this is obviously talking about Christ. Micah was written around 350 BC. So about 300 over, over 300 years before Jesus, the prophet Micah stated that Jesus, the Messiah, would be born in Bethlehem. And that the Messiah would not just be any ordinary man, because his going forth had been from of old, from everlasting. So this will be a Messiah who has existed for all eternity. He was never created. And then we see the fulfillment of that in Luke chapter 2, verses 15 to 16, where it says, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe 
lying in a manger. So we see that the creator of the universe was a baby in a manger in Bethlehem, and he done that for us. And in John chapter 4, verse 14, we read, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And that's Jesus, of course, speaking. And in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, we read, Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. So it was no mistake here that this water was coming from the well of Bethlehem that David called out as a drink offering. So this, like with Jacob, is an example of where the Lord allowed an offering that took place outside of the outside of the temple, outside of the sanctuary service. But there was a good reason for it. And so in Psalms chapter 22, verses 14 to 18, now this is another prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was written over a thousand years before Christ was born. It says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws and thou hast brought me into the dust of death for dogs have compassed me the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me they pierced my hands and my feet i may tell all my bones they look and stare upon me they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture and of course, we know now from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you basically have all of the books of the Old Testament, apart from the book of Esther, but it's mentioned within the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that was found in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls in um, near the Dead Sea. And in those Dead Sea Scrolls, you had the book of Psalms and they're dated to around over a hundred years before Christ was even born. So people can't even make the argument that these prophecies of Jesus were made after he lived and died and rose again from the dead. Because that's a, that would be an argument that some atheists would use, could you have used before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, even though it would be a really, it would still be a really weak argument. <laughs> but this proved that all these prophecies were there already. Hundreds, in fact, this one over a thousand years before Christ came and fulfilled these prophecies. Before, of course, they pierced his hands and his feet, and his soul was poured out like water. So, Christ, who was born in Bethlehem and said he will give us a well of water that will lead to salvation, was poured out unto death. Hence, why David was longing from, for the water from Bethlehem. It was given to him and then he poured it out as a symbol of Christ pouring his life out for us. And of course, David was the one that wrote this psalm. So he knew what he was doing when he was pouring out that water. And Sister White even says that a lot of David's psalms, most of them were written during the time when he was, you know, fleeing from Saul. When he was being persecuted. And that was actually when he was the most closest to God, when he was running for his life. He was righteous also in the days when he was a king, but we know that he did fall. He did make mistakes, although he did repent and he died as a righteous man of God and we will see him in heaven. He's currently not in heaven, of course, because he's sleeping, but he will be raised from the dead when Christ returns with the rest of the righteous ones. So it's even likely that David wrote this very psalm at the, around the same time that this event happened where he poured out the drink offering unto the Lord. And so in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, we read, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and chewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And just stopping there, this reminds me of something I read in Steps to Christ, of how all that, all that the world has to offer, whether it be the pleasure, whether it be fame, whether it be money, whether it be the lies and the fiction in Hollywood movies and what have you, all of that is like a broken system. 
So a cistern is like a vessel where you would hold water, like a an old school water bottle, if you like. But the world can't quench anyone's thirst because it's like a broken cistern. You pour water into it and there's holes all in the bottle. So the water just comes out. You're never full. And that's how it's like living in the world. And I experienced that myself. It's like no matter how much quote unquote fun you get up to, no matter how much partying you do or whatever it may be, whatever sin floats your boat, you're always going to have that hole in your heart, that feeling, that longing that something is missing. That something that is missing is your creator, the same creator who had his hands and his feet pierced for you at Calvary so that you may live and have everlasting life and peace even in this life on this destitute planet. Um, Brother Gideon just posted a, oh, oh, he just posted a picture of a cistern in the, and a well in the group chat. Okay. Ah, okay, okay. So maybe I got that wrong about the cistern being like a bottle then. That's what I thought. But even still, if a broken cistern is like a well, that means it's not going to fill up with water. And of course, Christ is not broken. It's like a fake well. Okay. Okay, so in John chapter 4 verse 10, it reads, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And that was, of course, when Christ was speaking to the woman of Samaria. And then in John chapter 19, verses 28 to 30, we read, this is when Christ is hanging on the cross. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was a set, a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. In other words, he died. So the fountain of living waters himself, he who created all things seen and unseen, loved us so much that he came down. He was born as a baby in a manger of Beth in Bethlehem. He never sinned, although he could have. He never sinned so that at the height of his manhood, at the age of only 33 years old, he died on the cross. He poured out his life to the point where he said, I thirst. And that fountain of living waters is Jesus Christ. And he done it for you, brothers and sisters. He loves you that much. And if you haven't received Christ into your heart as yet, as I said, don't delay, for you never know. Today could be your last day on this planet. And without Christ, without faith in Christ, you cannot enter into heaven. And if the question comes into your mind, why is that? It's because we've, we have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. What is sin according to the scriptures? It's breaking the commandments of God, one of the Ten Commandments or all of them. So if you break the Ten Commandments by lying or stealing or even by looking at a woman to lust after her, which would be breaking commandment number seven, not to commit adultery. Now, all of us have done these things. That means you can't enter into heaven. That means you're in big, big, big trouble. But all that trouble <laughs> that should come upon you, which would exclude you from heaven, was put upon Christ at the cross. All you have to do is believe and have faith that he did die for you. And then you are to live for him. And living for Christ is keeping his commandments out of love for what he done at the cross. And all the other blessings he bestows upon us. That's why Christ said to the woman, um, go and sin no more. And that's why he said you will be born again in John chapter 3. Because you no longer live as you used to live when you meet him. Everything changes. And so in um, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, page 
page 161, paragraph 2, Sister White says, The mission of Christ's earthly life was now nearly accomplished. His tongue was parched and he said, I thirst. They saturated a sponge with vinegar and gall and offered it him to drink. And when he had tasted it, he refused it. And now the Lord of life and glory was dying, a ransom for the race. It was the scent of sin, bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute, that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Death is not to be regarded as an angel of mercy. Nature recoils from the thought of dissolution, which is the consequence of sin. And we see that Psalms chapter 69, verse 20 and 21 prophesied this when it said, Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Of course, the broken heart part of it is that, yeah, Jesus, he didn't, it wasn't the pain of the cross that killed him, although it would have been excruciatingly painful, but he actually died of a broken heart. His heart literally broke, which is what caused him to die, because this, all the sins of the world in all ages was poured upon him at that point. So the Father and the Holy Spirit had to withdraw their presence from him. Even the angels withdrew their presence from him. Because he literally became sin for us on the cross. And that's why when Jesus was on the cross, he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachani, sabachani, which translated means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because imagine, Jesus Christ, as an eternal God, was with the Father and with the Holy Spirit for all eternity. And they were never separated. They were always, had, they always had, they've always had each other's presence. For eternity. So that's like a billion times a billion. Now imagine if one of us went to our sleep early. How sad we would be to be deprived of our brother and sister's um, presence in the church family. But Christ at the cross was now being deprived of the presence of his Father and the Holy Spirit. Which he had known since forever. And ever and ever. And again, he done that for you brothers and sisters he done that for me he didn't have to either but he done it out of love for love is stronger than death says in song of solomon and so spirit of prophecy volume 4 page 19 paragraph 1 it says amid forgetfulness and apostasy god had dealt with israel as a loving father deals with a rebellious son admonishing warning correcting Still saying in the tender anguish of a parent's soul, How can I give thee up? When remonstrance, entreaty, and rebuke had failed, God sent to this people the best gift of heaven. Nay, he poured out to them all heaven in that one gift. For the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, it says in the book of Romans. It's a free gift. Just accept him as your saviour today. And so, going back to the importance of why David poured out water rather than the strong drink that was usually used in the um, sanctuary service. It says in John chapter 19, 34, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith, and forthwith came there out blood and water. So when Christ was dead, the Roman soldier, he pierced him on the side to make sure that he was dead. And then came out blood and, wa blood and water, which has a significance because in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, page 102, paragraph 2, it says, While Jesus hung upon the cross, as the soldier pierced his side with a spear, there came out blood and water in two distinct streams, one of blood and the other of clear water. The blood was to wash away the sins of those who should believe in his name. The water represents that living water which is obtained from Jesus to give life to the believer. 
And so first John one nine, when you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. So if you go on your knees and you know you're convicted that you've sinned against God and against heaven, you can confess those sins and he can forgive you because you believe in the sacrifice of Christ. So like in other faiths, they believe that all you have to do is ask for the forgiveness and God can just give it because he's merciful. But the truth of the matter is, is that sin is so terrible in the eyes of God. It's so bad. It has to be punished. You can't just ask for forgiveness and he forgives you unless, unless you have a redeemer. And that one redeemer is Jesus Christ. So that your sins, which you should die for, are now placed upon him. And so I'll finish this study. Not this study, but this portion of the study, if you like. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 6, where it says, And he said unto me, it is done. And this is Christ speaking. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And, of course, here's a picture of um, a beautiful waterfall. And there's a video here. That I wanted to show you guys. It's only two and a half minutes long, so we'll finish out on the video. If it the volume works, hopefully it will work, because I know there was issues there before. Um, so let me click on it. If it doesn't work, then maybe we just show it another time. Can you guys hear something? No, you can't hear it. Mm. Okay, no worries. I, d I don't know. I don't actually know how to get the volume here. Have I shared my audio? Oh, you have to share audio. Okay. Then I'll leave it then. Maybe after service. <laughs> you got a feedback loop. Okay, no worries. It was basically just... um. I mean, let me just, I won't play the whole video, but it's basically just this, like, you know, beautiful um, creation that Christ has made. And just, when I saw this, I was contemplating how the God who created all of this, all of this beauty, actually came down as a man and died for us. So, and also how when you look at how beautiful creation is it actually shows that our God is beautiful in his character because only a beautiful God can create this only a beautiful God so that's why even you know people who have never read the Bible can understand that there is a creator that, and that this creator has a you know a supernatural character So yeah, I know you guys can't hear any volume, but you can see the pictures, right? <laughs> cool. Yeah, so God who created <laughs> all of this was a baby in a manger in Bethlehem. <laughs> and has revealed to himself to us through the Bible. <laughs> and we have prophecy to know for sure that this Bible is of God. So he's left us with creation as an evidence of his existence. But then he's given us the Bible to show, give us a deeper understanding of who he is and what he requires from us. So I hope and pray you were blessed by what was heard this Sabbath day. And next up will be Brother Gideon. Yeah, let me just record um, my audio.
just in case Craig, um, you know, malfunctions. But I think Craig is still in the chat. Yep, Craig is still there. All right, cool. So for those of you that aren't aware or you haven't been with us the past couple of weeks, we started a new series called Establishing the Word. Uh, we started looking at the Bible manuscripts and started looking at at the King James Version compared to versions like the NIV. Um, that's on YouTube and we're going to upload the prophecies of Daniel on YouTube as well. Why are we doing this series? Well, as the title of the series says, Establishing the Word. One of the great things about God's Word is that he's given us many evidences in the Bible um, and that we can see in the world. So John 14, 29 says, and behold, I've told you before it come to pass that when it come to pass, you might believe. So Jesus actually tells us well in advance of the future that's going to happen because we know no man can predict the future. So when these events happen in the future, we have further confirmation that, OK, I don't need to go and research deep into the, I don't know, the Quran or the is the the Hindu book called the Bhagavad Gita? The, I can't pronounce it, but I don't need to do all of this. I've got concrete evidence in God's word. And I can know not, not just what's happened, but he can tell me what's going to happen in advance. And I can be prepared for what's to come. Right. So what did we cover? We went over the dream of the king, which you can find on the website. Um and we started to go into Daniel chapter 7, the prophecy of the four beasts, which really is just a copy of Daniel chapter 2. So just so we're all, all on the same page, in Daniel chapter 2, we saw an image of a statue which the head was of gold, the chest was of silver, the belly of um, brass, and the legs of iron. Now, and then the feet of iron and clay. And in the end, actually, let me whiz to the, should I whiz to the last slide? Okay, we saw the summary of that. The gold head represented Babylon. The silver arms and chest represented, um, represented Medo Persia. The bronze belly and thighs represented Greece. And lastly, the iron legs represented Rome. With the clay and the iron representing Rome and the miry clay representing the uh, church or the catholic church which we know um looking uh, back or retrospectively so in daniel chapter 7 we basically get that same vision but with more detail and god uses different symbols the lion represents babylon as we covered last week the bear represents medio persia greece represented the um is represented by the leopard and then the beast which is not given an animal sort of is a, not a specific animal is represented at, is named this beast so it's not like an elephant it's just called a beast and it has 10 horns coming out of his head we got to the part where we got to the fourth beast but just to cover off so we're all on the same page we know that the lion represented king nebuchadnezzar in babylon the empire of babylon because in Jeremiah 50 verse 17, it says, Israel is a scattered sheep. So Israel began to be scattered in 606 BC. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of Assyria have devoured him. And last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, have broken his bones. So there we see that within the Assyrian culture and then the Neo, wait, within the Neo-Assyrian culture and then within the Babylonian culture, it was lions were a big symbol. So God used the symbol of lions to represent Babylon. And in fact, when you go to the British History Museum, you'll find this all over their icons. So when you look at the walls of Babylon, when you look at the Assyrian art, when you look at what they used to do, they used to do things like lion hunting. The lion was a big symbol in Babylon. So the second beast that comes after the lion was the bear what beast overthrew the lion and beast represents a nation and we still refer to countries as beasts today we have the russian bear we have the um what's it the lion of the united kingdom we have the bald eagle of america what represents the beast um the bear 
it was the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, the Medo-Persian Empire was a joint empire between the Medes and the Persians. And in, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, um, Belshazzar died after Babylon fell to the Persian general uh, Gabrius without resistance on October the 12th, 539 BC, not AD. So the Babylonian Empire was from roughly 605 BC to 539 BC. That's when most people date it. Um, and it was the Medo-Persian Empire that crushed it. Daniel actually lived to see for the fulfillment of this prophecy. Then, um, not going into the details of the bear, you, uh, that study will be uploaded, but going into the leopard, we know that the leopard came after the bear. And what nation destroyed the bear nation, the bear nation being in Persia? What nation did that, which would take the place as the leopard? So, quoting from the Encyclopedia Britannica, again, the Achaemenids, which is another name for the the ancestors of the Persians, if you will, were the dominant dynasty during Greek history until the time of Alexander the Great. And the use of the name Persia was gradually extended by the Greeks and other peoples to apply to the whole Iranian plateau. So then after the Persians came Greece, Alexander the Great being the first king of the United Greece. Now, um, we're going to get more detail into that when we get on to the next study dealing with the goat and the ram next week so we're going to look at more prophecies related to the persians and the greeks to set us up for more prophecies of the little horn but just covering this here we'll get into more detail alexander the great was prophesied to take over or the nation of greece was prophesied to take over from the bear and it was in 330 i believe it's 330 bc that um, Alexander entered into Babylon. Um, Darius III, who was the last Persian king, was assassinated because he had lost um, a battle to Alexander the Great. I believe the battle was either 331 and then Ale Darius was killed in 330 or it was both in the same year. Regardless, the fact still stands that it was Greece who represented the leopard nation. Now, Going after Greece, the leopard nation, comes the fourth beast. So we've got that clear so far in our recap. The lion was the first beast. The bear was the fourth beast. Uh, third, second beast, sorry. And then the leopard was the third beast. Now we're going on to the fourth beast. And this is where we got to. And after this, I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. So there's meant to be another beast which comes after the leopard, which then takes the supremacy. It's funny because it was the Romans that defeated the Greeks. It says that the battle pitted, speaking about the Third Macedonian War, this was 168 BC roughly, I believe. The battle pitted the Macedonian phalanx against the Roman legion. Uh, quoting from the Britannica again, with the latter emerging as the more versatile fighting formation. Macedonian losses were great, and of the estimate, estimated 40,000 engaged, some 25,000 were killed, and more than 10,000 were made prisoners. Perseus fled, allowing the Romans to end the Macedonian monarchy and divide Macedonia into four republics. Okay, so after the kingdom of Greece was subjected on all its lands by the Romans, Rome became the predominant in the, um, in, across the globe. The predominant empire across the globe. Now, note this, because this is where we picked, we got to last week. It says, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. Rome, in the western part of Rome, it was prophesied that Rome would be divided in Daniel chapter 2. Rome divided into two first, then it divided into ten in the west. Ten kings did arise. Namely, through the tribes of the Huns, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Franks, the Vandals, the Suevi, the Burgundians, the Heruli, the Saxons, and the Lombards. Without going into too much detail, essentially, the western part of the empire was split into ten tribes. The barbarian tribes which split apart Rome, split it into ten. 
going on from prophecy number nine, Rome, it was fulfilled that it did split into ten. It says that three horns, this should be prophecy 11 actually, but three horns would be plucked up by the roots. So each horn represents a king of the kingdom or a partition, right? It says that three of these horns representing three of these kingdoms should be plucked up. In Daniel chapter 7 verse 8, it says, I considered the horns, each representing a king, and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So before the little horn comes up, because we're getting into the identity of the little horn, pay attention to this. Before the little horn gets its supremacy, three horns need to be plucked up, right? Three horns need to be removed out of the way before the little horn gets their power. So historically speaking, um, it was the Harulai, who were plucked up because this little horn was collaborating with the eastern part of the empire and then the tribe of the Harulai were plucked up. That was in the year 494, 493 AD. The Vandals were plucked in the year 534 after um, Belisarius um, managed to beat the Vandals. And then the Goths were plucked up from Rome and then later destroyed um, out of, well, history, in the March 538 AD. So they were moved out of Rome in 537, but then in 538 they completely abandoned the siege. And in 538 the Pope, or the man that was in collusion with the eastern part of the empire, who became Pope, he managed to take the ascendancy, and from that time, the head of the church also had power within the state. So church and state became fully powerful in 538 AD when Pope Vigilus ascended the papal chair. So just not to get into too much, eh, this is long to read, but I will, um, this is essentially part of the history where it says that uh, quoting from, I think it's Pro, Pro Copius, Pro Copius, I think that's how you pronounce it. But he basically mentions that uh, Vigilus, he was in Sicily in 537. So he couldn't actually enter into Rome in 537 because it was too dangerous because of the siege of the Goths. But in 538, when the Goths gave up Rome, trying to get back Rome, then Vigilus could enter into the city and he was officially the Pope of Rome. And this was to fulfill, because we're now going to get into um, more recent prophecies as well. This was to help fulfill the goal of the church that the church has been planning for and are still planning to this day. It's going to help us to understand the aims of the papacy, even in the time that we're living. This was a letter to the then Pope in 533 from Emperor Justinian. I read this last week, but this will help you to see the politics of the day. Because what they were trying to do is they wanted to unite the church and the state. Obviously, God seeing this well in advance gave us the prophecy so we can understand the mindset of these people. Why did they do this? Because it was their understanding that if we unite the church and the state and the Pope is the head of all things, we can save all men, right? We can have everyone in one church. Everyone should be subject to the holy, well, they call holy, they're not holy, to the Roman pontiff. That is what all the popes throughout time have believed in their heart of hearts. They genuinely believe that all men need to be subject to the Roman pontiff, whether you're Christian or non-Christian. You need to be subject. Well, if you're non-Christian, you're going to be their type of Christian. And we're going to get into more prophecies which will expose this, but it says, with honour, so this was Justinian to um, the Pope then, with honour to the Apostolic See and to your holiness, which is and always has been remembered in our prayers, both now and formerly, and honouring your happiness, as is proper in the case, so this is just greetings, but I'll actually skip to the part where it says, we hasten 
Okay, as is the proper in the case of one who is considered as a father. So this is the emperor calling the Pope a father. We hasten to bring to the knowledge of your holiness everything relating to the condition of the church, as we have always had the greatest desire to preserve the unity of your apostolic see. So they wanted to unite all the churches. And the condition of the holy churches of God as they exist at the present time. And that they remain without disturbance or opposition. That means there should be no other church. There needs to be one church and every church through force needs to be subject to the Roman pontiffs. Therefore, we have exerted ourselves to unite all the priests of the East and subject them to the see of your holiness. And hence, the questions which have at present arisen, although they are manifest and free from doubt, and according to the doctrine of your apostolic see, are constantly firmly observed and preached by all priests. So they also needed to make sure that everyone is preaching what the Pope is preaching, which is heresy. Um, the Pope was preaching heresy, but let's continue. We have still considered it necessary that they should be brought to the attention of your holiness for we do not suffer suffer meaning to allow so we do not allow anything which has reference to the state of the church even um, though what causes the difficulty may be clear and free from doubt to be discussed without being brought to the notice of your holiness basically we don't allow anything to go unnoticed before you because you are the head of all the ch holy churches for we shall exert ourselves in every way, as has already been stated, to increase the honour and authority of your see. So the point was this. They wanted to give the Pope state power, right? To give the Pope a sword. This was the uniting of church and state. But in 533 AD, they couldn't fully fulfil their plan because there was another Pope which got put in by the, um, what's his name? Odoacer, I don't believe if I remember the history correctly, and he was not fully with this idea. So the plan was we need to take back Rome, that's why they went and got Rome. We need to take back Rome and install our own Pope on the on the throne and continue with this plan. So in 538 is when they fully enacted this plan essentially. So the church sought to annihilate opposition so then he goes on to say therefore we request we request your paternal affection that you by your letters inform us the most holy bishop of this fair city and the, your brother the patriarch who himself was written by the same messengers to your holiness eager in all things to follow the apostolic see of your blessedness in order that you make it clear to us and that your holiness acknowledges all the matters which have been set forth above and condemns the perfidy of those who, in the manner of the Jews, have dared to deny the true faith. I think that's referencing Sabbath keepers. For in this way, the love of all persons for you and the authority of your see will increase and the unity of the Holy Church will be preserved unimpaired when all the most blessed bishops learn through you and from those who have been dispatched by you the true doctrines of your holiness moreover we beg your blessedness to pray for us and to obtain beneficence of god in our behalf so there was the reason why the little horn annihilated the other three horns those other three horns did not agree fully to the doctrines of the pope there was something and maybe you've heard of this there was something called the council of nicaea in 325 which was what really helped to even catapult um, the authority of the popes even further. The Nicene Creed was the basis of the doctrine of the Trinity, right? And at that point, they wanted to force everyone to agree to the doctrines of the church, the first um, hurdle being the Trinity. Now, three barbarian nations did not agree to that. They were Arians. So that's why they were taken out of the way. The Pope and the state with Justinian were working to ensure that there was no Arianism, there were no heretics, there was none of that. One church, that, this, was, uh, this has always been their aim, 
one church, one pope, one ruler for all men across the world. That's it. Now, just for everyone to know, we both all, we are aware that this debate was even incorrect because what the Catholic Church was seeking to do in 325 with the Nicene Creed, even that was false, false doctrine. So both Arianism and uh, Trinitarianism was false doctrine. They, they, were, they were false doctrines. But uh, this was the argument, essentially. So you had two camps arguing over false doctrine. Both were wrong, but, you know, as it is, as is the case, both were arguing um, over things they did not understand. It's like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were the ones who typically held more um, higher offices. The Sadducees could were involved in the priestly um, office as well. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees, by the time Jesus came, uh, they were both wrong. But they were both arguing with each other all the time. But when Jesus came on the scene, then they united. Why? Because they both, they both camps hated Jesus. And it's going to be the same, even in these end times. Although the modern Aryans disagree with the Pope, they're going to unite against us because we are the other. Even though the doctrine is clear and understandable, they won't want to get into the truth of the Godhead. Because both camps are wrong. But moving on from that, Daniel also goes on to prophesy in this horn. So the little horn that comes out of the, remember, this beast has 10 horns. Three of those horns are plucked out and a little horn comes, grows out of the beast. And it says, and in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of man. What do the eyes of man represent? Proverbs 27 verse 20 says, hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. So these are the um, human ambitions of the papacy. A man will lead this kingdom, this little kingdom, this little horn, and their ambitions will never be satisfied. They will have endless ambitions, as in their ambitions will be extreme. So from the Council of Florence, which the Catholic Church upholds to this day, they say this, we also define that the Holy Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff holds the primacy over the whole world. Let me repeat that. It did not say the whole church. It did not say the whole of the Vatican. It did not say the whole of Italy. It says, we also define that the Holy Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff holds the primacy over the whole world. And the Roman Pontiff is the successor of Blessed Peter, Prince of the Apostles, and that he is the true vicar of Christ and the head of the whole church and the father and teacher of all Christians. It did not say half of Christians. It did not say one tenth of Christians. It said all Christians. And to him was committed is in blessed Peter the full power of tending, ruling and governing the whole church. And as is contained also in the acts of ecumenical councils in the sacred canons. So what's the aims of the papacy? The aims of the papacy is to control the whole world. They believe it is the right of the church and the Roman pontiff that the world be subject unto them. You can find this council within their list of councils. You can find it on their websites. Like I can give you the, the link. It's papalencyclicals.net. Go to church can, councils, um, click the drop down bar, go to Council of Florence, right to the right. You will find it there. They still believe in this. They haven't changed. And we're going to get... Because before, we're, we're looking at where they used force to enforce their rule. When we get to the Little Horn, part two, in a couple weeks, we're going to look at how they're, looking to, how they're working nowadays. Because when they first came to power, they worked by force. Now they're working by peace. So everyone thinks, oh, these old men in robes, oh, you know, they wouldn't harm a fly. No, no. They are not harmless. <laughs> they are not harmless. This political organization is not weak, nor is it irrelevant in any way. They are very, very well connected, more than you can believe. Let's continue. 
It says, oh, I forgot to change the title there, but it says in Daniel chapter 7, 21, I beheld the same horn, the little horn, made war with the saints and prevailed against them. We can get this admission now. Catholic brutality against who they called heretics, which is actually saints against Protestants, the Albigenses, the Waldenses. This history is so well documented. You're not going to find somebody saying the Catholic Church never did this. This would be this. No, you're not going to find that. Um, even the Pope himself recorded in the year 2000 BBC News said we are asking pardon for the divisions among Christians and for the use of violence that some have committed in the service of truth, the Inquisition, basically, and for attitudes and mistrust and hostility assumed toward followers of other religions. Uh, said Pope John Paul II, dressed in the purple robes of Lent, which is a pagan holiday, but uh, that's uh, another topic for another day. The phrase violence in the, servants of tr in the service of truth is an often used reference to the treatment of who they call heretics during the Inquisition, the Crusades, and forced conversions of native peoples. So part of the people that they were killing, apart from other people who weren't Christians, is they made war with the saints. Those that believed in Christ, they killed them. So that prophecy was fulfilled. Prophecy 13, blasphemy. Daniel 7, 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High. To, to speak against is also symbolic of um, making yourself equal to. Um, and it says in Daniel, yeah, so making yourself equal to. Another quote you'll find is when um, when Jesus is in the judgment hall with Pilate and the Jews are trying to pressure Pilate to condemning um, Jesus. They say, he that speaketh against Caesar. No, I think he's in another account, sorry. But the quote is, he that speaketh against Caesar maketh himself a king. So to speak against also meant to make yourself equal to. Um, biblically speaking, but there's two definitions of biblical blasphemy is when you make yourself equal with God. And I believe that is doo -doo 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 -doo, John 10, 33. What? Ah, John 10, 33, where it says, what does it say again? Thank you for posting. The Jews answered him. Yes, there is saying for a good work. We stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man, makest thyself God. Amazing. How did it slip from from the mind? And the second definition of blas blasphemy is Mark 2, 7, where the Jews said for a good, uh, for a, no, no, not for a good work. I just said that. Uh, they asked him a question, rhetorical. Why does this man thus speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God only? So when you claim power, when you claim equality with God, that's blasphemy. When you claim um, power to forgive sin, that's blasphemy. Speaking from the popes themselves, it says, uh, this is John Paul II in his book, The Crossing of the Threshold of Hope. And there's way more, but I don't have time to read list upon list of quotes of them confirming prophecy. Uh, there's, that's for self-study. But <laughs> the web, there's a link on the website. You can read more. And if you need even more, um, Pastor Nick has documented that in depth. Um, but he said this, the leader of the Catholic Church is defined by the faith as the vicar of Jesus Christ and is accepted as such by believers. The Pope is considered the man on earth who takes, doesn't even say rep represents, who takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. Let me, let me rephrase this just so it makes sense. If somebody says that this person takes the place of your father. Is that a replacement or represented? Is that representative? That's a replacement. If someone takes the place of someone else, that means that person was there in that place. And then for it to be taken means someone else is in that place. Basically, the Pope is claiming to stand in the same place that Jesus should stand. Now, whilst we know the Trinity is false doctrine, is still the sense that he's equaling himself to God, Jesus Christ in this case. 
And also, in terms of the power to forgive sin, it says, quoted from the Catholic um, Encyclopedia, Volume 12, uh, this judicial authority, speaking of the authorities of the Pope, will even include the power to forgive sin. So some of you will see this when um, you see confessional booths. The priest has no power to forgive your sins, nor should you be confessing your sin sins unto the priest. You confess your sins to God, and he will forgive you. Prophecy 14, uh, Daniel 7.25, and says, And they shall think to change times and laws. What do times represent in the Bible? Exodus 23, 14 says, Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. So times, prophetically speaking, represent appointed times that God has set aside. Or, or literal times as well. The Catholic Church, I'm going to take the one way that they fulfilled this. They've changed the Sabbath. Well, they haven't changed it. But they thought to change the Sabbath day. Um, quoting Cardinal Gibbons, of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change, Saturday Sabbath to Sunday, was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. Oh, no, this was the Chancellor of Cardinal Gibbons. But then also in the Catholic Record of London, uh, the writer claimed that Sunday, and it's true, Sunday is our mark of authority. It should say of authority, not or authority. The Church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. And so the Catholic Church claims to change the Sabbath. They think they can change the Sabbath. They can't. But not only this, but the Catholic Church has actually removed commandment number two. They've, because that says don't bow down to graven images, which they do. They've shifted commandment number four into three and they try to split commandment number 10 into two to make up for, you know, they've removed one. So 10 minus one is nine. So they need one more, otherwise it's not the Ten Commandments, it's the Nine. Um, and in terms of how long they will rule for in their first rule, it says, And they, the saints, shall be given into his hand until a time and times and dividing of time. Now let's break this down. In the Bible... A day equals a year in prophecy. So if I say you're going to get, I don't know, a car in 10 days, prophetically speaking, I am saying you're going to get a car in 10 years, if I'm speaking prophetically. If I say you're going to have a house in five days, and it's prophetic language of the Bible, I'm saying you're going to have a house in five years. The verses which substantiate this is Numbers 14, 33 to 34, um, where... Numbers 14, 34 says, After the number of days in which ye have searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year. So God was saying, you're going to wander in the wilderness 40 days. But each day counts for a year. So he says, Each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. And in Ezekiel 4, verse 6, it says, And when thou hast accomplished them, when speaking of the days of sin of Israel, which were years, lie again on thy right sand, right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So one day, one year. So how much time were the saints to be given into the hand of the Vatican? In Revelation twelve fourteen, we learn what a time, times, and the dividing of time or half a time represents. It says, and the woman representing the church um, were given two wings of a great eagle. Um, and she that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent, from the devil. What did these days, these times represent? Revelation 12, 6, and says, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Three score is sixty. One a score is twenty. One score is one times twenty. Two score would be two times twenty forty. Three score three times twenty sixty. That's why um that famous phrase four score and seven years ago. Four score eighty and seven eighty seven. So yeah. 1,203 score days is 1,260 days. 
The prophetic time clock says each day is a year. So 1,260 years were the saints to be given into the hand of the Vatican. Did this happen in prophecy? Vigilus ascended the papal chair in 538 AD under the military protection of Belisarius. That's according to History of the Christian Church. Um, which volume is it? It should be volume three. Yeah, volume three. But then we also learned that in 1798, General Berthier made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government and established the secular one. I'm missing the reference for the first quote, but the reference can be found on the website. Um, so all we have to do is do the math. 1798 take away 538 is 1260. The saints were given into his hand for a time, times, and dividing of time, 1260 days. So three and a half years in terms of days, but it was literally when you convert the three and a half years to days is 1260 days. Each day for a year, it's actually prophetically speaking in code 1260 years. And that was fulfilled to the exact time that it was meant to happen. So when speaking of um, the strength of the papacy, it says Daniel 7 verse 7, um, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, speaking of the fourth beast, the nation that the, I, the little horn sits upon, and it had great teeth of iron. Well, it had great iron teeth. I said great teeth of iron. Um, but it had great iron teeth. So we should find in that nation the strength of Rome, imperial Rome. It's funny because the popes actually claim to have their powers from the Caesars. So Caesar was a name which was then put upon the... Um, emperors of imperial rome and the popes claim that title even to this day i believe if you were to go to the vatican you can still find this printed all over in different places all over the vatican um but pope pius the ninth said in his um discourse the caesar who now addresses you and to whom alone are obedience and fidelity due so there's many Parts where they will claim the titles that the Caesars used to have, like the title, the Roman Pontiff or Pontiff Maximus is not a title that came up at the, the time of the church. It was there that it was the Romans were using it before that. Um, the Pontifus Maximus. So all these titles that the popes have taken upon themselves, they've still got that in that sort of um, those traits from Imperial Rome. And they still work with that Roman power. So it is there that we will conclude. But a brief summary of what we have gone over so far. We have learnt that the lion was Babylon. The bear was Persia. The leopard was Greece. The fourth beast was Rome. Out of the fourth beast arose ten horns. Ten barbarian tribes. Three were plucked up by the little horn, which was the papacy, the Pope. Those three were plucked up because they did not hold to the authority of the Pope. The goal and aim of the papacy was to establish all men under the Pope. From there, the Pope sought to kill all opposers. So there the Popes made war with the saints. To establish their power even further, the Popes then thought to change times and laws spreading their mark of authority upon the whole world and now here we are in the current day where the little horn is back and we're going to get into those prophecies in the next couple of weeks next week we're going to look at the goat and the ram and the week after that we're going to look at the little horn in more depth and a few and more prophecies and we're going to get into the study of judgment etc etc so there's a lot of prophecy that we're going to be covering um but the reason why we've gone over all this is this will now make sense to you if brother gabe if you can post revelation 17 um revelation 17 verse 12 to 14 
Okay. This is a future pro. Ooh. This is a future prophecy that's going to happen in the very, very near future. And I'm going to close on this verse. It says, and the ten, so there are going to be ten horns again. But this time, notice what happens. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive kings, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. The beast here is the same papacy, the same little horn of Daniel chapter 7. It says, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So the point is this, the Vatican haven't stopped their plan of trying to control the whole world. Not in the slightest. <laughs> they are going to get a one world government. It's what they're working for currently. It's why many different nations are agreeing to them and bowing down to them. If you've seen Indictment on the Vatican Part 1, near the end, it will open your eyes to that prophecy a lot. Or that prophecy will open your eyes to their movements quite a bit. Them meeting with, you know, the Zuckerbergs, the Amazons, the Google, the Joe Bidens, the Trump, everyone. Them establishing their diplomatic ties everywhere. Now... The point is this, what they could not do in the past, they're going to keep trying to do it. And they're going to keep trying to do it right until the end. They're going to get their one world government, but it's only going to last 15 days. And it's going to be during the time of the plagues. At that point is when Jesus comes back, just after that. Just after their one world government. So it's not anything new in terms of what they're planning. What they're planning is what they've always wanted to do in history of, of old, of long time ago. They believe that every human creature needs to be subject to the Roman pontiff. So you see where, um, you see where some, sometimes you get a story and... I don't watch these fictions anymore, but there are there's a group of people that will seek out they they call it world domination or absolute power. These men are truly seeking control of the world. And the Bible has prophesied that long in advance. So when we see them today, hold on, let me let me go to uh because um, Sister Melissa has posted this in the chat. Let, when we see this today, you guys can see my screen, right? Oh, you guys can, yeah, you see it? You can see my screen, okay. When you see this today, right, and let me just go to the, the, the image, which can just show you, these are not schoolboys that have come to meet the Pope. These are not schoolboys that have come to meet the Pope. These are heads of state, um, leaders of the European Union. When you see them coming and the Pope comes in, um, addresses, yeah, 27 EU heads of state. And he's receiving them all. Let me full screen this so you can get the full image of what's going on here. That was the ex-Chancellor of Germany. Can you see the... Let me, I want to I want this to stay in your in your mind. Look at the chairs that are there. The red chairs that look uh I mean they aren't so cheap but look at the uncomfortable chairs not uh, maybe they're a bit comfortable but the chairs they're given, right? Now compare that common chairs to the throne that he has as they're all circled about him. Does it, sh it should show you where power lies. It's not um, them receiving him. It's him receiving them. This is nothing new. <laughs> this is what has been happening before we were born. So, I pray you are all blessed <laughs> with what you heard this Sabbath day. Um, we went through a lot, but the two angels on side, I know, right? 
but uh, we'll close out with prayer. So if you can kneel, please do so. We're going to close out with a prayer. And if you can lift up holy hands and lift up your eyes towards heaven. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you for allowing us to come together and go deep into your word with the drink offering, learning how you um, poured out all those sins, all that wrath um, to upon your son that he will bear it for us. Uh, we thank you for that, um, Father. We um, worship, love your son. We pray, continue to form us in his image. And we also thank you for your word, for warning us of the plans of Satan and his agent upon the earth in the Vatican. Um, so we'll be aware for what they're planning and how they're going to use it against your people. And how we can stay clear of that and follow you wherever you go. So thank you for all these warnings, Father. And we love, praise and worship the Godhead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>